Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to Daily Drop-In Morning Show with the Teach Better team where we are live every single morning, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern, currently streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, but also we appreciate you if you are listening after the fact on Teach Better Talk podcast. We have a whole lot in store today with a brand new guest that you guys are definitely going to want to follow on Instagram because I do, and also we have good news articles we have a really cool story about teach a teacher in Las Vegas this morning, and we also have, obviously, our holidays. So feel free to say hello in the comments, participate live with us, or if you're watching this after the fact, we'd love to hear from you. So take a screenshot, go post on Instagram, make sure you tag us. Our handles are on the screen, and let's get into some of the fun. <laughs> morning, everyone. It is bright and early here on Daily Drop-In, and we are going to joke because we're saying it's 7 a.m. Eastern, but for me, it's 6 a.m. because I'm in Central Time Zone, and Riss, it is really early for you right now. What time is it? Yeah, it's about four. Oh, my gosh. I just feel like you deserve an award, a trophy, like some massive, massive celebration, maybe an all-exclusive paid vacation for coming on the show today. That's kind of what I'm thinking. <laughs> No, I'm so honored to be here. Like I would have come at any time. I, yeah, I'm so honored and humbled for the opportunity and you know, I can take a nap later. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. I was so excited when you said yes, because I kind of reached out on a whim. I've been following you on Instagram for a while. I love the work that you do. You're constantly putting out support for teachers. So I'm so excited for the Teach Better community to connect with you. If I assume, you know, if they haven't connected with you yet, maybe I'm really slow to the game and everybody knows everything about you. But in case they don't, would you mind sharing a little bit about what you do in education, kind of all the all that jazz? Yeah. So I have been in education for over 20 years. Um, kind of my story is I started as a tutor um, at a placement for boys that were called delinquent, um, who ended up being like my brothers. Um, I had um like students who didn't know how to read were 17 years old. I'm like, how does this happen? And, you know, at 20, it's very outraged and figured that I was going to save every single student from falling through the cracks. Um, did not quite happen <laughs> that way, um, but it did light a fire in me that's um, continued with me through my education journey. Um, so from there, I decided after tutoring, I became a, um, a teacher at an independent study school. We had a lot of students who were young moms or just didn't really uh, fit in a traditional school model. Um, and it was just a really beautiful, beautiful experience, um, kind of doing school a different way. And then from there, I went to the Peace Corps. I'm kind of like an education nomad a bit. I'm just going from here to there. Um, so I went to the Peace Corps and I was um, an education volunteer, kind of charged with bringing learner-centered education, um, trying to combat, um, oh my God, corporal punishment, which was fun times. Um, and when I got back, I decided to serve my community. So I actually started teaching at a charter school right across from uh, the housing project that I lived in when I first got to Oakland. Um, taught there, had always wanted to teach community college, got to teach community college. The last seven years I've been in it, I was an ELA curriculum director for five small schools. And now I'm I'm on my own. I am I started educating Marissa as a safe, like a safe space for teachers to grow and develop. Um, I really want to serve teachers so that they, they can serve their students and communities better. Um, and I think that that comes from being authentic, being their most authentic selves, kind of getting back to that um, reason they became teachers in the first place. Um, and sometimes I think it, it, you need to be a little subversive um, to serve the students when we're in situations and institutions that don't always have the students' best interests in mind. Um, so yeah, I, I'm now just kind of starting this new, this new journey 
and ex am extremely excited about it. Holy cow. I had no idea that your background was so diverse with different experiences in education. I think it's so incredible that you've been able to go into each one of these very separate experiences to support education holistically, but support students, support educators. And then now you're still at this point in your career, still striving to share and support and give resources. I mean, that is the epitome of like all-star educator right there. When you're looking at the work you're doing now, do you find that there's one area that you're like, ooh, when I work with a teacher on this specific topic, I see so much change. Like this is truly where my passion lies. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for me to narrow things down because I love so many things, but my real, the heart of my work lies in um, literacy work. Mm -hmm. I am a reading specialist as well. Um, and I've always just loved literature. I have a report card comment that my mom said, or a report card that my mom saved. And the comment from my second grade teacher was, we love the books Marissa brings in to share with us. And I'm like, and you know, so many years later, I'm still sharing books with people, um, because I really believe in the power of literacy and, um, you know, literature is based on humanity. So it's, it's just a way that we can connect across difference. We can feel um, empathy for other experiences. It's just, to me, it's magic. So um, anything ELA book related, I'm all in. Mm, so cool. Oh, so, so cool. You know, it's interesting for me. I, we talk a lot in this network, um, you know, Teach Better team is truly global. Um, obviously the primary school districts we work with are in like kind of the North America, US, Canada region. I, I do have to say, though, I always find it so wonderful when I connect with somebody new that we're able to bring into kind of that Teach Better family. And I don't quite know how we connected on Instagram because I just feel like sometimes Instagram is a rabbit hole of finding people that are passionate about a topic and then you follow who they're following and it just continues and continues. But what's your experience been like on social media, growing your network that way? Obviously, you're very active on Instagram. I don't know if you use other platforms as well. Can you tell me about what that experience has been like? It's It's been nice. Um, I'm, I'm really trying to take my time and be intentional about um, how I'm creating curating the space. Um, I try not to post other people's work unless it's in my story. So everything on my page is um, generally my content, which means it takes me longer to post than like I'm not putting out four or five posts <laughs> a day because I, I just don't have the time for that, but I want what I post to be meaningful. Um, and again, to come from me, like I love sharing other people's work in my stories and I, I like, to, I make sure that I credit them if it's something original, if it's like a repost of a repost, I don't always take the time to do that. Um, uh, and I, you know, it's been slow, um, but that's okay. Like I'm, I'm totally okay with taking the time to curate and create the a really intentional space to support educators. It's I, I really appreciate that you note that it's feeling slow. Um, I don't feel like it's slow in terms of following you. I, since I followed you, I feel like you're constantly popping up on my feed. I'm constantly just like learning so much from you, which I really, really value and appreciate. That's why I love specifically Instagram is like I like to consume on Instagram. Um, although sharing, I guess is, is fun. There's pros and cons, of course, but I will say, I think a lot of people get on social media. They want to connect with other educators. And when you get started, it's, you're following, you're following, you're following. And then it does kind of hit a lull. It feels a little slow. And I think acknowledging that, naming that, knowing that that's a part of the experience, it's not a bad thing. There's still people watching. There's still people gaining value from you. I mean, that's a huge benefit there. So I, I appreciate that honesty. There absolutely is elements of connecting with people and trying to find time to feel like you're getting what you need out of it. That's tricky. Yeah. When it comes to uh, everything education, it's always cool to bring new people on the show because we always get different perspectives, different conversations. Uh, it's always good to hear about different people's backstories, all that good stuff. We are going to transition here into our brainstorm bank, which is a segment every single show that we have, where we intentionally ask our community if they need anything and get into kind of the inner workings of our theme every single week, as well as obviously some deep dive conversation into the things that you're most passionate about. So 
We're going to be right back. All right, friends, good morning, good morning. It is Thursday, December 2nd, and we have a lot in store for you already. We are going to transition here into our brainstorm bank, which is a specific area where if you have questions, we're going to brainstorm. And Riss and I are not going to promise that we have answers. We are just going to promise that we want to brainstorm with you. And we're actually going to kick it off, not with our theme this week, but actually with a comment that we received in our private Facebook group, which by the way, friends, if you're not a part of our private Facebook group, that's at teachbettergroup.com. It will redirect you there. It's a Facebook private group. Uh, over 6,000 educators in there. And we actually have an exclusive invitation going on for some of you who might be interested in joining our live series in about a month that has to do with mastery learning. So if you're interested in learning more about that, head into the group. But Riss, we got a question and I thought this would be perfect to discuss on the show because as we said, it's not about having the right answer, but about really fostering a community that's willing to brainstorm, regardless of what wacky idea or silly problem you're having. So there was a question that was posted that I know you and I may not be experts in, but if you're up for it, let's discuss it a little bit. Does that sound good? Yeah. Awesome. So in our private Facebook group, uh, shout out to Jen, who posted this question. It has to do with the fact that she wants to use merge cubes and um, headsets with her students. She doesn't necessarily say how old her students are, but it kind of goes into about how they're researching what VR headset or content to be looking at. And it looks like they're looking at expeditions and merge as um, as options for the content and also the tools and resources. For those of you who may not be familiar with merge cubes or VR, we're talking about virtual reality. You come in, you hear like virtual reality partnered with augmented reality. They are very different, but it's this concept of you looking at the space that you're currently in and being able to add things to it using a device or phone. So some of you have seen it in commercials these days where there's headsets on people's heads, they're using their phones on their faces, and they are transported into a brand new world. Um, there's some really cool opportunities there. Riss, tell me your experience with VR and AR. Have you seen it before in television commercials? Have you used it? Where, where has that been for you? <laughs> I probably only used it if I'm thinking correctly, like on Amazon, like placing imaginary objects in my home. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. You're right. That is such a like mainstream thing that, that Amazon just rolled out. If you're buying a, a, a piece of furniture, you can like put it in your room to see the sizing. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Oh <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm new to this. I'm really excited though to learn more. Okay, wait, because I know we're going to brainstorm here and I know neither of us are experts in this recommendation that Jen's looking for, but how cool is that? I didn't even think about the fact that Amazon and other mainstream companies are kind of using VR and AR to, to, to kind of help with purchasing. I mean, even Ikea, you can go in and you're looking at a couch on your phone and then it allows you to turn on your camera and it kind of like puts the couch in your house so you can see the sizing, if the color works. It's not perfect if you've ever tried right. it. Really not <laughs> but the concept is exactly what we're talking about. Good connection there. Um, when I've used this in the past, I've I've dabbled more with virtual, no, 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 virtual reality, augmented reality. I wish we had somebody here in the comments that could help us. One of them is when it changes the whole environment that you see. So if you've seen in movies before, like, player one, he's literally like transported into a new world. Everything around him looks different versus I believe augmented reality. I could be totally wrong. One of them means you're just placing an object in your reality, very similar to the Amazon that we were talking about, where Amazon puts like a piece of furniture in your room. Um, I have really used both. Um, but one of my favorite resources that I used was an app that allowed you to look through your phone to a different world. It felt like a portal that the students could like walk into, but it used both virtual reality and augmented reality because the app that I used would essentially give you this like, I mean, truly it was like a portal. It was a circle that when you were using your camera, you had to find where the portal was in your environment. And then as you walk towards the portal, you could actually walk into the portal and then you were in a completely different space. So some of the places that we went were like deep sea diving or um, 
like we were walking on the moon. And it was really interesting because you had students kind of like walking around the hallways, walking around your classroom <laughs> to like find the portals. It's kind of a cool concept, right? It's such a cool concept. And you know what? Now I'm thinking about it. It's like Pokemon Go, I think, is Ooh, augmented yeah. reality. So I definitely did that with my kids, my my own children. When when it was really popular, we walk around and try to find yes. the, the Pokemon as they were hiding. Um, okay. I'm loving these connections. Rose. Can you tell me, I know some people did Pokemon Go a ton, but tell me about um, which one, uh, Pokemon Go, in case people have not been familiar. So you took your kids out, you had your phones out. I know you're hunting for Pokemon characters. How does that all Yeah, work? and then you look on the screen and you're looking like the, the you're seeing augmented reality and then you're looking to find them and, and catch them. That's um, so cool. But oh, it's okay. not, it's not with like, a, it's not a full... Oh, thanks, Elijah. Yeah, Elijah's helping us out here. He says, I think AR is when you place an item in the room. That's what I thought. Like you're augmenting, you're changing the room you're currently in. VR is when you're transported somewhere else. Elijah, we appreciate your thoughts. I think that's right too. It makes sense with like the augmented reality versus virtual reality. Very cool. So thank you for noting that, Elijah. You get bonus points this morning, Elijah. <laughs> um, so with this concept though, if she's brainstorming tools and resources, while I am not an expert and I have used so many different apps, one of the things she noted was the concept of a merge cube. Riss, have you seen these merge cubes? No. Okay. So here's how I'm going to describe it. I'm going to describe it like a two-year-old trying to explain something. So <laughs> low, low, low level here. It is, and I used to have so many of them. It's like, it, okay. It's like a squishy ball that you would throw around the room, except picture it as a square form. And then it has a pattern on each side. I like to describe it as like, it looks like a QR code on each side, essentially. And when you hold it in your hand, it's, it's either a folded up piece of paper that you've created as a merge cube, or I physically had like these squishy balls that truly looked like, like foam balls, merge cubes. And you'd hold up your phone and it turns the cube into something. So you could hold up like, like a turtle, you could hold um, the sun, you could have the solar system in your hand. So what it does is you're using the merge app. It's reading the code on your cube and then there's ways that you can manipulate it. And some of the cool parts about it is that because you're holding it, it's a 360 resource now as you're looking through your phone. So there's different games, there's different kind of like pieces you could look at, but because you're physically holding it, there's a lot of like manipulation you can do to this item. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's so awesome. So cool. So I would say I think that Jen is on the right track looking at Merge as a resource. Merge as a company I know has been developing this for a number of years, even though this is relatively new technology. I say that loosely because education is always behind the times. But this concept of AR and VR in classrooms is about five to 10 years into the technology. It's just not mainstreamed yet. So I think Jen turning towards big companies that have been doing this for quite some time. We're seeing this very progressive about five years ago um, would be my suggestion because those are going to be the companies right now that have done the research, have had the pilot groups, have found the issues with the resources and have probably problem solved a lot of hurdles. So companies like the ones that she named in her post would probably be my recommendation. So Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. And as soon as you were talking about like all of these experiences, I was thinking a lot about writing and just how fun that could be like you know teaching the students how to write descriptively about these different spaces and the sights and the the sounds and the feelings that they feel um like i i'm oh wow i'm like oh. thinking i wish i had that back in the day when i was still in the classroom well, and I appreciate this connection risk because I think a lot of people see that type of technology or these types of resources and they say, they sit back and say, oh, that would only work in a science classroom or, oh, that would only work in a social studies classroom. And what you just connected was, no, you can bring in experiences that may not directly correlate to that specific content area. So for example, like me holding the solar system in my hand using a merge cube, like that may not in theory direct, like you know, connect directly to a writing assignment. But now if you can get this technology in students' hands, using this as a descriptive writing activity, holy cow, now you've just opened up brand new doors or a reading class that might have a theme or a or a character that really enjoys a specific opportunity that we can use with a merge cube. 
I think you're totally opening a different perspective on how to bring in new experiences, but still connect it to the standards and core content that we're working towards. Yeah. Oh, so fun. Well, shout out to Jen for asking those questions. Please make sure that you're constantly questioning as you continue to be a learner, carrying that teach better mindset, being better every single day. So thank you, Jen, for posting that in our private group. You know, Riss, there's a lot of things that we can talk about today. I know we mentioned that we had a theme this week before we came live of celebration, but I also want to make sure we get to some of the work that you are so committed to. You are continuously talking about, and I know you have a lot going on that you are continuously pushing out to teachers. And that has to do with a concept I never get to learn about, and it has to do with power. Can you tell me about this concept of power and the work that you do in this space? Yeah, um, a lot of like my work focuses on creating um, really great learning environments. And I think a lot of the issues that we come up against with classroom management um, have to do with the way that we yield power in a classroom. Um, so like currently I'm working on creating a course called Caring Authority um, in my learning community. And within that course, we're looking at like the different power dynamics. So like power over, power with, power within, which is the power that we all innately have, including our students, right? And then um, power to, so the power to do things. Um, and thinking about ways in which we can do a lot less power over um, and a lot more power with and um, cultivating power within within our students so that they are empowering themselves. So, you know, we don't empower others. They already have power within them. We can just help um, guide them to accessing and harnessing their power in positive ways um, and um, create environments where they can exercise their power. So I, um, yeah, so that's what I've been kind of, I've been working on just trying to come up with this thing because I think it's such an important thing if we're, we're talking about having equitable classroom spaces um, where our students can really have voice and have agency. And, you know, we can do a lot less policing of their behavior and policing of them um, because they have the power and they have, um, they have the potential. So even if they don't quite have the skills yet, you can help them cultivate those skills. Um, and, you know, when you deny students power, it comes out. <laughs> they express their powers in ways that you um, may not like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting for me, Riss, because as I was listening to you discuss power, even now, but also off the off air, when we were talking before we came live. This is a concept I never hear people talk about as their passions. And I, I love that you have taken this very common, relatively overused word of empowerment, and you're actually breaking it down to discuss the how, the what, the when, and the why of ensuring that, that teachers begin to look at this concept differently. Do you have like, I mean, it's so arbitrary, like three tips or like three go-to statements or food for thoughts that you can share with our community having to do with power. It sounds like you're making, I mean, a whole course on it. It's, I mean, sign me up, but <laughs> what do you feel like are the common misconce misconceptions with this concept or where do you feel like a teacher needs to begin when, when making this shift in their mindset? I think one of the, the major things is the difference between um, power and authority. So we all have power um, and like I said, that power over is the one we want to divest from. Um, but authority is something that's like granted to you. It's something that's earned. So it's a privilege, right? To have a authority in a classroom. And um, so one of the things I like for teachers to consider is like, how can I yield this authority responsibly? Like people have given me their like most precious, like precious, things ever, they're children, they're in my hands. So how can I, um, how can I take care of them? Um, but also like, how can I not have Lord of the Flies going on in my room, right? So, <laughs> um, 
So it's 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 about like having a balance there. So you know you have this authority. You've been you've been given it. You've got to teach the credential, or you're working on it. Um, the students see you as 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 a guide. Um, so yeah, really thinking to yourself like how how are the power dynamics happening in my classroom? Am I the only one who holds power? Do am I the only one who sets the agendas? Do I ask my students for input? Are they allowed to to help have some to have some control over the space and over what it is that that we're doing? So um, I don't know if I necessarily have tips, but more of like reflecting on really what's what's happening um, in your classroom and looking for places where you can do better, right? You can do better, and when students have have power. <sighs> They show you like who they can be, and and you just have a lot less um, a lot less power struggles because you're helping them to cultivate um, that power that they already have within them, and to use and also you're modeling how to use it responsibly. So how are they using it with one another? How are they you know powering with one another in, instead of like I feel like I need to have power over this you know my classmate because of x y and z it's kind of more like hey we're a community look what we can do together um you know so that's what i say yeah and and it's it's funny because everything that you're sharing i think is also bringing some different perspective to the, to the language i mean truly even just the word power dynamic when you say hey what's the power dynamic in your classroom in my mind, the only time I've used the term power dynamic is when there is a negative connotation to it. Like, oh, my classroom, we're having some problems with, you know, the power dynamic. You're now discussing it in a way that actually gives, uh, I was going to say gives power. That's not what I would be like, gives value to this, this concept of people working in a collaborative environment and feeling like they have a voice, feeling like they have opportunities that are before them and then using the the you know themselves to also bring and gain value in in this community which is a very different perspective I've never explored this concept I'm so such a fan that's so okay. great <laughs> so when you're looking at creating a course um I I know that you are constantly sharing I know that like, it's so good. What can a teacher expect in this course? Because I know truly, even just learning in this small amount of time that we have together, I would absolutely dive into this concept more. So what are you hoping for from this course? What type of learner, what type of educator do you expect to benefit from this course? Okay. I think any educator who's looking to really stop doing all the heavy lifting. I think we have a lot of exhaustion because teachers are are doing too much mm -hmm. um, because they haven't, they don't maybe don't have the tools yet or they haven't like built the trust with their students to let them do the heavy lifting and let them work collaboratively to do the heavy lifting together. So um, really for me, it's about you know, creating this like really thriving um, classroom community, and I've seen it. Like I've had, I've had it in my fourth grade class, my my middle school class, my community college classes, and it's the most beautiful thing to actually really be able to be a facilitator in the classroom, not just like the sage on the stage. Like I, you know, there are definitely parts that I hold as an educator, but I want to empower the other um, the other people in the room because they they come with a bunch of stuff too like so so much outs and then we don't know what they don't know and we don't always know what they know um i i always tell student t tell um teachers that i'm working with about a student that i had who during history class would just be like amazing and i'd be like and one day i just was like eric how do you know so much about this stuff and he was like i play assassin's creed and i was like that's so dope like bring it all in, like help us all out. And it was, you know, it's just like they, the students aren't just in our class, like our classrooms aren't the only places they're learning. They're, they're getting input from all kinds of places. So um, I just love to, to, 
to be like in community and and I learned from them too. So educated immersive is a play on words because it's really about me learning, me guiding, learning, guiding, learning, guiding. Completely. And and that's honestly a huge element of the Teach Better community. I knew that our community was going to benefit from having you here as a part of Daily Drop-In. But to me, we just created a whole nother connection, a whole nother bridge because a ton of our Teach Better community are, are working towards fostering a mastery learning classroom. That's a huge kind of focus that we have on the team. It's a lot of the professional development we get to provide. And when we're talking about mastery learning, it really is transitioning the teacher, teaching the teacher how to step away from being a lecture focused. I'm the smartest person in the room. Let me bestow my information to, her, to you. But really, how do we make them a facilitator? And it's interesting. We focus so much more commonly on the instructional practices. Like how do you foster a classroom that has classroom management and content alignment, da, 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 da. You're really talking about something that has to be layered on top of that to be successful because you're discussing the climate, the culture, and I love this, the power dynamic between now the teacher choosing to be a facilitator and now the students choosing to have that power and, and enjoy that power in the classroom of being able to truly like provide for their community. And I, I think this is so fascinating. I want to encourage everybody in our community to go check out this this different concept. We always talk about education as kind of being a deli sandwich, right? You layer all these things on top and <laughs> you hopefully get what works for your student clientele in that moment. And to me, this is such a perfect overlay on top of so many things that I'm telling our community, you're already doing this. So you definitely want to go layer this piece on top. That's so cool. Yeah, I like that. Deli. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. This kind of connects to our theme this week. Um, every single week, we have a different theme. And this theme was focused on celebrating. And our concepts, when we were talking about celebrating and this being our theme, the first week of December was, can we provide suggestions for the end of the calendar year to make sure that you're setting up your students to be successful for 2022? Can we talk about it now so you can have a few weeks to like get it ready versus talking about it the week of and you know then you're scrambling if you want to put together a fun activity. I wonder if the some of the work that you're discussing in terms of students identifying and truly understanding the power that they possess, if that's actually a way to to end the year strong and come back at the new year even stronger. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um Thinking about like celebrating the end of the year for me and um, the advice I would give teachers for their classrooms is really to focus on community for these last couple of weeks that you have the students um, and also focus on resting and restoring and taking the time. These have been like, um, we've been through quite a few really difficult years and um, you know, and things haven't stopped. So I think that we should take a note from from Mother Nature, like during this time, you know, the it's getting darker, we are needing more rest. Um, and I think we've been really kind of disconnected from from our natural, you know, we have artificial light, we have all these technologies that help us like keep going, 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 producing, producing, producing. And I think that this is a time for us to to slow down a little bit. So with the students, um, you know, as we're ending the year, doing activities like, you know, read alouds, um, getting cozy in those pajamas, um, having them, you know, tell stories. Um, I would, I mean, if you are not mandated to give homework, like give some, give the parents a break. <laughs> like this is a time to rest and be with family. Um, and, and if you do need to, if you do have to send stuff home, have it be stuff that's like really collaborative. So have the students um, learn more about who they are, where they're from, um, where their ancestors are from, um, traditions and things like that. So like really thinking about like um, what what do we really need more of during this time? So I don't know that you need more worksheets. I mean, I'm sure the district folks will be mad at me. I was a district folk too, but I don't know how much more data we need, how much more evidence we need, but I do know that we need, you know, connection and we need 
empathy and we need time to rest and we need time to connect. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the things that I would really be trying to focus on at the end of the school year. It's not a waste. It's never a waste to be building, um, you know, these social emotional muscles with our students. Um, and again, like it helps build this community where the students um, feel empowered and that they, they're they responsible for one another and to one another. And um, it just makes everything else much, um, everything easier. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's where I am. It's, it's less activities, more connection. <laughs> well, and I think that you're focusing on something that teachers at the beginning of the year feel confident that they need to focus on, right? Like I have to learn all my students' names. I have to get to know them as people. And then we get in a few weeks to the school year and we, we don't stop that, but it, be, it goes on the back burner. So many educators just, you know, we have to get into the work that we also have to be responsible for. Your focus on focusing on community and connections. Yeah, I love even you brought up like like students learning about their ancestry and 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 different cultures. This is such a beautiful time to do that. Really ending the year strong, you know, becoming identifying who you are and who you want to become. These are beautiful overarching concepts that you can now go find little activities to build into your classroom and think about how much stronger of a community, how much stronger of an individual learner you're going to be fostering to kick off the year in 2022 when they come back and they say, I really feel more confident about who I am. I feel so confident with the people that I'm around. I mean, talk about power, right? That's, that's really incredible. Yeah, and it can be it can be fun and still connected to the standards. Like, I mean, I've had um, friends who've done like soundtrack of my life projects. Um, you know, like a family soundtrack, like about like who we are as a family. Vision boarding. Um, you know, and I always tell my students kind of the thing under the thing. So, like, if I'm asking my students to write, I'm really asking them to communicate effectively. So when we're talking about writing, it's not like, I just want you to follow all these rules. It's like, you have something really important to say, and I wanna make sure that the end user can, really gets what you're wanting to say, because you're not gonna be able to sit next to them and explain the little nuances. You have this shot to really communicate effectively. So again, I think that there are ways that we can tie in the standards to these, these um, activities that feel really good where we're really fostering creativity and again connection which is just we need it so much right now we do ah so good so so good Riz. i i have loved learning about this and i i can only i can only imagine what more i'm going to learn when i continue to to not only engage with the content that you push out but um all the work that you continue to do and share it's so powerful we're in transition here into actually a, a beautiful celebration that we're going to have in our good news story, some holidays. There's some good stuff we still have coming up. So we'll be right back. We've been talking a ton about community connections and this concept of power we're really, really happy for those of you that are joining us live. Thank you for being here. Or if you're listening to this after the fact, I am so appreciative that you choose to join our daily drop-in morning show. Riz, we are in a segment that we do every single day where we talk about goofy holidays that exist every single year. These can be holidays that you use to foster connections with colleagues as you're walking through the hallways or um, something that you can bring to your students. And we also have a big, big, big celebration of a good news article today of a fellow teacher in Las Vegas. So to start us off, Riz, how do you feel about celebrating a holiday? Are you a holiday lover? What's the, what's the deal? I am a holiday lover, although more recently I've been really just more intentional about um, how I'm celebrating certain holidays. So I'm um, trying to move away from being more capitalist in, in our celebrations and more connect, <laughs> connected. 
I feel like there's a theme arising. <laughs> but I mean, truly, some of the holidays we talk about are so wacky, but if nothing else, it gives us something to smile about, something to talk about, and allows us, again, to connect with others. So here are the goofy holidays for today. It is National Mutt Day. So for those of you who have a dog at home that has some mutt in them, I always describe my two dogs as mutts. I don't know if you have uh, animals at home risk, but I always I've describe them. mutt. <laughs> Do you have a mutt? <laughs> I'm going to celebrate him today. His name is Loki. Ooh, Loki. What a fun name. I always, I know people always joke like, oh, what are your dogs? I'm like, I don't know. They're mutts. Like they're a mix of everything, I'm sure. So shout out to Harvey and Alfred who are, and Loki for the mutt day. That'll be funny. Um, I always believe that anytime there's a dog holiday, you should be sharing photos of your dog. So I will be looking on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at our, hopefully our Teach Better family posting about their mutts today. It is also um, business of popping corn day. I don't know what that means, but definitely go get some popcorn today because it feels like <laughs> it might be a requirement. It's also National Fritters Day. For those of you who like cooking a good fritter, um, why not? I think any time that we can have great food, sign me up. Um, right. In addition to all these goofy holidays, as you all know, uh, it is still a holiday in not only um, a very incredible Indian culture, but also the Jewish culture is celebrating some religious holidays today. So continue to have that in your thoughts as we continue to connect with people that are celebrating and acknowledging different things around the world and continue to be a learner as we do that. We have a wonderful article today about a teacher that it just wouldn't have done it justice if I talked about it. And so what we're going to try and do, risk, cross your fingers for me, we're going to try and play a little video, just a quick news segment um, on this special thing, uh, this special celebration I saw all over social media. So mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can share this screen across your fingers. All right. And let's try out this news article. Let's see how this works. And that was 2021's People of the Year today. This list includes country music legend Dolly Parton, actress Sandra Oh, Olympic gold medalist Simone Biles, and a Las Vegas teacher. This is Juliana Uturbe's People magazine cover. She is the 2021 National Teacher of the Year, and she's part of the nation's Teachers People magazine honoring this year. Uturbe is a special education teacher at Kermit R. Booker Elementary. She's the first teacher in Nevada awarded the honor of National Teacher of the Year and the first Latina to win since 2005. She and her family immigrated to the U.S. from Colombia when she was young. And Governor Sisolak tweeted this out, saying Nevada is home to the best educators in the nation, including our own Juliana Uribe, the 2021 National Teacher of the Year. So, Juliana, your dedication to your students and your craft are an inspiration. On behalf of the Silver State, thank you. So exciting, right? People That's like amazing. Congratulations. I want to see this cover again. I'm going to see if I can pull that up. I love this beautiful cover featuring, gosh, talk about power. That is a powerful photo right there. So right. exciting. Oh, my God. I have to go pick up a copy and support. I mean, we teachers should be on the covers of magazines. Um, they are truly heroes, especially during this time. Like, I just have nothing but honor and respect and love for teachers. Um yeah, I love them. <laughs> so shout out to Juliana and the amazing things that she continues to do as a Las Vegas teacher. I believe she's in Clark County in, in uh, the Las Vegas area. So definitely go check her out. I can only imagine the celebration she has of this, but I'd love to see the world, our community celebrating an educator and all the educators out there. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about her. But again, I wanted to make sure our community was aware of this big moment, not only for somebody that obviously is in our community, right? A fellow educator, but also an opportunity that we are seeing in the world of news networks, like the one we just shared, Fox 5 um, in Las Vegas, but then also others acknowledging the, the power, the relevance, the importance of a teacher. Uh, we want to continue that story going. And remember, if you're an educator out there, share your story so that others can celebrate with you. So very, very cool. Good news story there, Riz. Yeah, that was awesome. Oh, I feel so happy. <laughs> I want to make sure our community connects with you. And I know many people are going to watch this video live and be able to see that your Instagram handle is on the screen. However, for those people that might be listening on Teach Better Talk podcast, or even so if they have their phone propped up or their computer propped up, but they're getting ready for their day and they're not necessarily looking at the screen, 
Would you mind sharing how people can stay connected to you? Yeah. So on Instagram, I'm at educating Marissa and that's Marissa with two S's and one R. There's so many variations to this name. Um, and also have Facebook, you know, slash educating Marissa, I'm pretty much educating Marissa everywhere. I have a website, which I'd love for you to come and hang out with me, maybe join my community. I, I really, I just love community. I love to be with other educators, connecting, learning, growing, evolving. Um, so yeah, it's www.educatingmarissa.com. Um, yeah, I mean, those are the places that, that you'll find me and I really just can't wait to meet you. I, I, I really believe in connect <laughs> connection for the hundredth time, but it's, it's really like, for me, like what we're human, like as humans, we're communal. And I think we've gotten away from that. And, um, you know, over the past couple of years, it's been like, oh, we really do need to get back to, to, um, to the spaces that really fill us in, you know, those are our communities. I love it. Rissa, I'm so honored to not only be a part of your community, but of you now officially a part of the Teach Better family. We joke that once you're on the daily drop in your family, whether you want to be or not. And we always joke that um, while there's so many different avenues for the Teach Better community to collaborate, whether people choose to be an ambassador or a guest blogger, maybe they're part of our speakers network or they're part of our podcast network. Regardless, we love bringing new people in. And so whether it's our podcast network with all those incredible podcasts that are bringing new people into the Teach Better family that you guys can go check out, by the way, at teachbetter.com slash podcasts. Um, we also talk about how daily drop-in is a beautiful opportunity to continuously add new faces, add new friends to that community. So thank you, Riz. It's so, so fun being able to talk shop with you. And I thank cannot- Thank you. Wait for, this has been an honor. Like I am so happy to be connecting with the Teach Better family. And yeah, this is this has been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Ray. Good for everyone else. Have a wonderful Thursday. It is December 2nd. You're about to have the best Thursday ever and you don't even know it yet. So go fill up your coffee, get amped up for the day. And we can't wait to hear how it goes. So keep us updated. We will see you back here tomorrow morning, unless you're participating in all the masterminds. Gosh, there's so many masterminds later this afternoon for our Teach Better community. But if you're not heading there, we will see you bright and early tomorrow morning where we will conclude the week with the one and only Brad Hughes joining the show. So thank you so much, Riss. Thank you so much. We're going to stick right here, but for everyone else, we'll see you later.